good evening. It's good to be with you tonight. On Sunday mornings, we have been studying through the book of Hebrews in the adult class as part of our theme of victory in Jesus. And this morning we looked at chapter 10 and reason together about some of those things. And Lord willing, next week we'll think about some of the things that come in chapter 11. And chapter 11 of Hebrews is probably one of the most well-known chapters of the Bible that people think about and refer to when they think about the idea of faith. And as they consider, as we consider that, faith is something that many people in the world or people around us in general claim to have and understand, uh, so they think what it is and how it affects different things in their lives. People call upon faith, they say they have faith, and they say that they use faith in things that they do each and every day. What we want to think about this morning, or this evening, is this idea of true faith. What is real faith? What is true faith? What does God want us to see? Why did he put this chapter about faith here? And how does it affect the lives of those he was writing to, and how does it affect our lives as well. That's what we want to see tonight, and I hope you'll take this journey with me as we try to understand some of these things together. When you look there in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, here is this verse that all of us know so well. Many, can, if not all, can quote it. Unfortunately, sometimes far less can explain it, and that's what we want to attempt to do tonight as we try to think about this idea of true faith. The New King James Version says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Lots of people have commented on this verse and what it means and and where it takes us. Albert Barnes says, there is scarcely any verse of the New Testament more important than this, for it states what is the nature of all true faith and is the only definition of it which is attempted in the scriptures. Another commentator uh, named Pink says the contents of verse 1 do not furnish so much a formal definition of faith as they supply a concise description of how it operates and what it produces. So what we see here as we look at this verse, and we'll talk about why it's here in just a moment, we see kind of the, the author of Hebrews telling us about the role of faith and the scope of faith, not just the definition of it, but it tells us what faith is, how it enables us to be able to do what needs to be done. So as you think about that tonight and we consider some of these things together, realize that you need true faith. You don't just need a generalized version of it, you need what the Bible defines as real faith, as true faith. If you don't have it, you won't make it. And that's what I think we'll see that the writer is trying to get across to these brethren here. And we can see how that puts into play in our life as well. Verse 1 talks about that in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Verse 2 through verse 39 talks about how that kind of faith works and what it does for us. And shows us how and why we should want to use it. So as we consider that, let's first consider the context of where we find this verse. Because that has a lot to do with understanding I think, what true faith is. Context is important in any type of thing that we are striving to consider. You can pick a paragraph out of a book and read it and have a totally different meaning if you don't understand the context of where it is. And so it's important for us to see the context of this. And as we consider things and we think about the book of Hebrews and as we've been studying that together, consider this group of brethren who are struggling a little bit with their faith. Because they're facing some things. They're facing persecution. We'll show that as we look through some verses here in a little bit. Some persecution they faced a little of. Some is still coming. And they're being warned about that. And so the writer is trying to encourage them to build their faith when he gets to this point in the letter. And you consider, we touched on this this morning. You have a group of, of Hebrew brethren who were used to doing things a certain way. They were used to seeing a high priest physically before them perform certain functions and rituals and sacrifices in order for them to be right with God. They were used to them themselves or or had been at one point in their life before they became Christians. They were used to physically going and taking the sacrifice and offering that when it was their time to do so. There was a, a temple that they came to that was ordained by Uh, by the leaders of the Jewish faith and how 
things ought to be done there. They saw these things regularly. These were a part of their lives. And as they started to embrace Christianity and try to embrace Christ and then are going to face difficult times, there's this temptation to go back to that which is physical, that they know and can see and makes them feel and understand what it is to come before God. And, and the writer's been telling them throughout this book that they need to move forward into Christ. So as we consider that that's the situation, consider also the warnings that we see about the coming persecution throughout the book of Hebrews. When you look at just some verses that we'll just kind of flip through here and notice, Hebrews 1 and verse 2 starts off talking about in the last days that God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He's letting them know this is how God is going to communicate with them now, not in the old ways that they used to be communicated with, with their fathers. In chapter 3 and verse 13, he talks about exhorting one another as long as it is called today. Kind of foreshadowing things that may come. The book of Hebrews was probably written slightly before the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus warned about what was going to come at that time and how terrible those things would be. They need to start building their faith, not slipping back into Judaism, but building their faith in Christ to be able to endure through some of these difficulties. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we see more foreshadowing about this coming persecution where he tells them not to neglect, not to neglect meeting together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And he says, all the more as you see the day drawing near. Could be having reference there to that coming destruction and how they need to pull together and be strong in true faith to be able to endure through those sorts of things. Verse 32 of chapter 10, he talks about recalling the former days after they were enlightened when they endured struggles and sufferings. So here's the idea throughout the book of Hebrews that they have to deal with some persecution. In chapter 12, there's a couple of verses here that point to things that are going to happen and talking about things that are shaken and but, but putting their faith and confidence in God, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we understand as we look through those things that they have this need to endure through some of these difficulties. And when you go back and, and consider that as well, you see that in the book of Hebrews. And I want to look at some of these verses because it sets the stage and paints the picture for us as to why... The writer chose, inspired by God, to say what he did about faith in chapter 11. In chapter 10 and verse 35, notice this with me here. As we think about this idea of needing to endure. Because this is a word that also shows up several times here in chapter 10 and in chapter 12. Nestled right in between that is this discussion about having true faith. Chapter 10 and verse 35, he says, Therefore... Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. How are they going to do the will of God? Well, they need to put Judaism aside. They need to embrace the supremacy of Christ and see themselves through the persecutions that may come. For them to do that, they're going to have to have true faith. And as we start to apply some of these things to you and to me tonight, as we think about the trials that we face, as we think about the life that Christ wants us to live, as we think about having victory in Jesus as we're trying to study together this year, we need to have true faith if we're going to be able to endure through those things as well. When you look in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, after he talks about faith, Notice, as we look at these first seven verses, how many times the writer mentions that they must endure or have endurance. They need faith for that. They need real, true, honest faith. Not just a general idea of believing in something. They need true faith. Notice with me here, chapter 12 and verse 1. Think about some of these things together with me. He says, therefore, since we are so rounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. He refers back to, to what we're going to look at in a few minutes in chapter 11. About those great cloud of witnesses of people of faith. He says, let us let also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, tells what Jesus did. 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. There's some more foreshadowing about some persecution that's probably coming. And you have... And have you forgotten the exhortation addressed as you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God treating you as sons. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? Here we see again this idea of endurance for that to be able to happen, for them to be able to live through this and maintain their standing before God, they must have true faith. So as we consider the context of where, this, where we find this, remember also what the writer has been doing in building them up in Christ, trying to take them away from going back into Judaism, trying to keep them embracing that which they once first did when they were first enlightened and remembering why they have committed themselves to Christ. Throughout the book of Hebrews, he's shown them Christ is better than the angels. He's greater than Moses. It's a better rest that comes through serving Christ. He is the greatest high priest. He is the executor of a better covenant. He is a superior sacrifice. All of these things relate to, to items that they knew under the old law and shows them through all of these things why true, pure, real faith is so important. Jesus is the right way. Jesus is the right course. He is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And therefore, they need to hold on to what they know and what they have been taught. That's the context. That's what we see before, that's what we see after as we think about these, this idea of real faith. So when you go back there to Hebrews 10 and verse 35 down through verse 39 as we're getting ready to, to get to that all-important verse, remember what we find there. We need to understand and appreciate the context to see the importance of this passage. So if you start reading here with verse 35, see where the writer is going here when we get to this chapter on faith. He says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has such great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and, pers and preserve their souls that's where he starts and when he and after that he goes to the passage that we know well now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and as he begins there and starts into the 11th chapter of hebrews he proceeds to give them example after example after example of how faith works what its function what its role is and what they can do with those things. Remember, this is someone who's trying to convince them to go down the right path and to stay true to that which they have first believed. And as we consider that tonight, we see where this passage fits and understand then why it's so necessary to have true, real faith in order to please God. That's what we see the writer showing them and that's what we want to understand as well. So having mentioned faith as an essential characteristic of endurance, he proceeds now to show them how faith is able to help us endure. And he's going to show us lots of examples of that. But first, before we think about what some of those examples means, and when, when we get to class next week, I encourage you all to be here next Sunday morning, we're going to go through those examples and section by section and look at that. But tonight... Tonight, I just want to think about this first verse and how it applies to you and me. What does it mean? Why is it there? And why did he say things the way that he did? The object, I think, of, of the writer here of Hebrews in this chapter is not to illustrate for us the nature of what is called saving faith, but rather he is trying to show us at this point in his letter unwavering confidence in God. Unwavering, unwavering confidence in sustaining our soul, especially in times of trial, and particularly in leading us to act 
on the promises that God has made, even things that we haven't seen. That's what he's trying to tell them. That's what we can take from those kinds of things as well. And so to do that, we need to appreciate then what this means. There's really two phrases here that we focus on as we think about it. I've left it in the New King James so that it's easier to understand because uh, it fits into our English language well. But, but notice what he says here. We'll notice some other translation. He says, first of all, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And when you look at some other translations, there's lots of different ways that it reads that help us get a grasp on what this phrase means. Faith is being sure of what we hoped for. It's an assurance of things hoped for. It's confidence as to things hoped for. And you can see all different kinds of ways that, that this phrase is translated. But consider what the meaning of these words are, because that helps us, again, appreciate what the writer is trying to say to us. Substance is that which is placed under. When you break that word down, sub and stance, if you think about the word sub, our English word sub, that usually means something that has to do with something that is under. A subfloor is a floor that's underneath. The floor that you put down is a finished floor. A submarine is underwater. A subcontractor is under the other contractors. We understand what all those things mean. So the idea of something that is starts with the, the, the prefix sub is a basis or a ground or a foundation for something. And when you go back and look at the, the original language this was written in, that's what these words bear out. Stance, of course, actually means to stand. And so when you put those words together, you have this idea of that which stands under. Our faith, the substance of things hoped for, our faith is our standing ground. Our faith gives us sure support while we wait on the promises of God. This idea of hope, things hoped for. When we look in the Bible and we define hope by Bible terms, hope is a confident expectation. It's something that God has promised. It's something that we can be confident is actually going to happen. It's not just a general wish. We use hope in a different way today, don't we? We say, I hope this happens, and we're not really sure if it's going to. We wish that it would, but that's not what this means. It's the substance, the standing ground of things hoped for, the confident expectation that we have and what God has promised. So when we consider that true faith gives us sure support while we wait on the promises of God, you contrast to that which is unreal, imaginary, deceptive, that which is very generalized and vague. Sometimes when those around us talk about having faith, they're wishing for something or or desiring that something may come to pass. And they say, well, you know, I, I have faith that that's going to happen. Do we really? True faith depends upon the promises of God and is are confident in what it is that God can do and believing what God can do. The point is, as we consider this, that faith is the foundation of our hope. Our hope is only as strong as our faith. So, Real faith or true faith is being absolutely certain that what it believes is true. So you consider your faith tonight. You think about the things that you believe, the things that you have been taught, the things that you hold to. When you face trials in your life, do you have true faith? Do you look at those things and you are absolutely certain that what you believe is true? We need to have confidence and endurance to stand our ground. And that's what true faith is. And when we consider then where this passage appears in the book of Hebrews, after he's talked about and made this argument for why Christ is greater and so much superior to the, to the old way of doing things, and he's going to go on to talk about the endurance that they're going to need and the difficulties that they may face and how they need to, to stay together with, the, with one another and, and deal with those things, they need real, true, pure faith. They need more than just a wishing for something. They need absolute confidence. And that's what he's trying to provide for them by this very definition. Well, what about the other part of it? It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Here's some other translations. Certain of what we do not see. The conviction of things not seen. And that, that's a good one really to, to think about. And the ESV talks about it as a conviction of things not seen. And that's the idea that we see put forth here. That's really the meaning of it. 
the idea of a conviction. So when we think about the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen, again, what's the meaning? Well, under the influence of faith, of true faith, one allows the things that, that we know to control our minds as if they were reality. That's what Albert Barnes says about defining what this means, the evidence of things not seen. Let me give you an example. Some of you have traveled abroad. I have not, far outside the United States. I've never been to England. I've never been to London. I hear that there is a city called London. I believe that it exists based on the things that I can know and see in the world around me. I see the news talk about it. I've read things in the papers about it and on the internet. I know people who have been there. I've never seen it with my own eyes. So I have to have faith, you would say, in a sense that the city of London really exists. And that may sound ridiculous to you, but I've never seen it. So the only way that I know it's there is by the evidence that others have presented to me. And I can tell you as I stand before you tonight, I believe that beyond the shadow of a doubt. I believe that the city is there, even though I've never seen it. So when we think about this idea of evidence of things not seen, we need to feel that strongly about the things that God has told us that he wants us to do, the promises that he will fulfill, the heaven that awaits, the Savior that has risen. We need to Think about those things and know that those are as assuredly, there, as assuredly there as a city that we know exists in this world that we have never seen. Faith is that which enables us to treat as real the things that are unseen. That's what true faith is. That is our standing ground. And when you consider then that, as he makes this argument here in Hebrews the 11th chapter and goes on to talk about some of those examples you get down to verse 6 is another verse that we often talk about in Hebrews chapter 11 think about how these two elements come together and define what Hebrews eleven six really says to us when you start there in, in verse 2 he goes on with examples and talks about um, how God has created the world and how Abel has acted on faith and in verse 6 he says this he says and without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here's another phrase that shows us some things about faith. We talk about the conviction of things not seen. We talk about the confidence of things hoped for. And look at how that plays into Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. We must believe that he is. We must have that conviction of something we have never seen. I have not seen God. I have not seen my risen Savior, but I believe that he is. And that's what God requires of me to have true faith. I must believe also that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I have confidence in that. This is my standing ground. And when you consider things like that, one who has faith is able to do those things when it is true faith, when it's the kind of faith that will get us through those kinds of difficulties. So as you look at this, then, when you consider the context of what the writer uh, is dealing with as he writes this verse, and you consider then what each of those things mean, what do those phrases mean, and how they affect a Christian's life, then one more thing that we need to consider is the application of it. What does it mean to me? How does it fit in my life? And as I look at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and I think about all those great examples of faith, how is that going to affect what I do every day? Each day that I live, I'm going to be faced with certain decisions. I'm going to find difficulties in my life. I'm going to uh, come, across, come, come upon different crossroads. And what I do with those things and how I deal with those things will directly relate to how strong my faith is. Do I have true faith? If my faith is strong, then my hope is going to be firm. But if I quit enduring, my faith is weak. Hope crumbles, and my standing ground comes out from under me. That's not what we want. We want to think about what real faith does for us. And that's, if you look at the bulletin there, there's several passages that go through the book of Hebrews, and that's really what he does through the 11th chapter, is show us then what true faith does. First of all, it gives us solid ground. 
When you look in Hebrews chapter 10, we've read this a couple of times, but notice, notice some of the phrases that are in there. He tells them, don't throw away your confidence. Why? It has great reward. You have need of endurance. And why is that? Because when you've done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised. Real faith gives us solid ground. If you really want the promise, if you really believe in those things, you must have true faith. What else? Well, true faith has God's approval. So that's another incentive for us to want to, to develop and to have that kind of faith in our lives. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 2, what does it say there? It says, for by it, as he's talking about faith, by it the people of old received their commendation. Those who were faithful to God, those who did what he asked them to do, because they trusted in him, because he was their standing ground, God was pleased with them. Consider that for just a moment. As you start to think about different Bible characters, there are a few that stand out. There are a few that God names as blameless or upright in their generation or walked with God. Think about Enoch. He's there in verse 4. Walked with God and was not, for God took him. Those who put their trust in God are the ones that received commendation from him. Don't you want to be one of those people? I do. And I hope that you do too. And for us to do that, we must have true faith. That's what true faith does for us when it becomes our standing ground, when it becomes our conviction for things that we have yet to see. What else? Well, true faith trusts God's plan. That's hard to do sometimes. Because when someone gives us a plan or when someone suggests something to us or for us that's easy for us to see and we can agree with it and we can say, yeah, I, I can see how that's going to work out. That's easy to go along with. But what about when it's not? True faith, trust in God. Notice here in verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham opened, obeyed rather when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went, into, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. You know, we can take a few minutes and step aside and think about all that was asked of Abraham. Abraham had true faith. To be able to do what God asked of him, if you stop and, and consider that, you're settled in your house where you live now. All of us have comfortable places to be. And for someone to come and ask of us what God asked of Abraham, is a real challenge. Abraham couldn't see where that was going to go. Real faith trusts in the plans of God. Real faith also believes what is hard. When you look here in Hebrews chapter 11 and, and verse 11 and 12, notice what it says about Sarah. It says, By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age. She can, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars in heaven and as, men, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. You remember this story. The angel of God, or God tells Sarah and Abraham that they're going to have a son. Sarah knows how old she is. She knows her own body. She knows how improbable, if not impossible, that is. Real faith True faith believes what is hard. All of us are going to face different difficulties in life. Are you willing to believe those things and to commit yourself to them? You know, sometimes it's we pick up the Bible and we read about things that happened in the Old Testament and, and we get into the, the habit of talking to our children, our grandchildren about the stories of the Bible. Sometimes we start to believe them as stories instead of actual factual things that happened. We need to, to use our real faith and believe what is hard sometimes and understand what God is able to do. Use our real faith to, to believe what God teaches us that we need to do in, uh, the lives, in our lives, in, in our marriages, for instance. The world would teach us this is how we deal with marriage and divorce and how we go about these types of things. God shows us a better way. And sometimes it's hard to stick to what God asks of us. Sometimes it's, it's hard to think about Matthew 7 and verse 13 and 14 when it talks about that only the few will inherit eternal life. When so, many of, so much of the world and even friends of ours are talking about having a good heart and obeying God and giving yourself to Him and all of us will get there just a different way. Sometimes there are things that are hard to 
embrace, but yet there are things that God tells us that we must believe, that we must give ourselves to. Real faith, true faith embraces those things. The Bible talks about forgiving your brother. Remember in Luke, the the 17th chapter, talking about forgiving someone seven times in the same day if they come and ask you that seven different times. And we read that, but consider that that's hard when that happens. Someone's committing the same sin against you over and over seven different times in one day and asking for your forgiveness. But God tells us that's how we're to live. Or we think about loving our enemies and going the extra mile and turning the other cheek. Those things are difficult when you're face-to-face with that situation. But true faith believes what is hard. True faith performs the difficult things. There's some things that God asks of us sometimes that are difficult. Think about this example here. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac who had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son. It's it's hard to fathom that if you stop and think about it. Abraham, so far past the age of childbearing, the son finally comes that God told him uh, that he would have, and then he's told to sacrifice that. Don't take that lightly. That is a difficult, difficult thing. But Abraham had true faith. And he gathered himself together and he went on to do just what God asked him to do. Sometimes God asks us to do difficult things. He asks us to trust in him, to put him first above all else, to seek first the kingdom of God. And a lot of times our careers or our families or our commitments get in the way of that. It's hard for me sometimes and I'm sure it's hard for you. Real faith though, true faith, performs the difficult things. When it's time to go talk to that brother or sister who's fallen aside or fallen away and we want to restore them and we know they're going to get angry about that we know that they may start lashing out and talking about some things that you have done in your life or or talking about the hypocrisy that they may see in the church or or talking about what god has done to them those are hard things to do but true faith is willing to do the difficult things true faith is willing to withdraw from that brother or not eat with them, as, as 1 Corinthians 5 talks about. That's hard. But most, most of all, and first and foremost, we want to please God. Abraham had to do something hard, and he was well rewarded for it. True faith helps us do those things. Lastly, as you look at the end of Hebrews, true faith endures. And, you know, if you haven't read this in a while, we're going to look at it next week in class. I encourage you to take some time and just read through these verses. We're going to read through them quickly here tonight as we bring this study to a close, and just consider what has happened to some of these individuals and why the writer includes them here to strengthen the faith of his audience. He says in verse 32 of Hebrews 11, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others were mocked. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And then he gives the reason why. This is why true faith endures. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. They did it because of a promise that was coming. And that's one of the things the writer is showing them in Hebrews. But look at what true faith does. Look at what true faith is willing to endure. Can you imagine some of those things? Can you imagine enduring that to stand strong for the cause of Christ? Being stoned or sawn in two? Can you imagine watching your family go through something like that? Or living the way that he says that some of them were willing to live in mountains and dens and caves, wearing skins in order to to survive, all for a promise that they didn't even receive in their time. But they had 
a strong standing ground. They believed without doubt that which they had evidence that God said would happen. So as you consider all of those things tonight, and you consider this idea of having true faith, think about the context that this was written in. Look at what the writer was trying to convince them of. They need to stay strong in Christ. They need to not go back to the ways of Judaism. They need to not give up during persecution and face the trials that were coming in their life. And if you read about that period of history, it was one of the darkest times in humanity. And the writer is using this to tell them that true faith is necessary to look towards God and to be able to overcome. What about you tonight? Where do you stand before God? What kind of trials are you facing? Because we all face them. We all have difficulties, and some become greater than others at different times in our lives. Some of them are spiritual, some of them are physical. Do you have a strong standing ground? Do you believe in the things that you know to be true? Do you believe that the tomb is empty? Do you believe that the Savior is risen? Do you believe that he has died for your sins and that he is reigning in heaven now? That he will come again? And take with him those who are faithful and who are willing to give their lives at this time to him that they might have an eternity forever with him. I hope that you can see those things. I hope that your faith is that strong. But if it's not, won't you change that tonight? Won't you examine the word of God and see where you can make that faith stronger and commit yourself to doing that, just as this writer wanted his audience to do as well. Take courage from those who went before us and all that they did that we too can have true faith. If there's any way that we can help you with any of those things tonight, would you let us know how by coming to the front as we stand and sing this song?